Good afternoon. I'm Yvonne Ferguson, a program leader at the NIH Common Fund, and welcome to the full application technical assistance pre-application webinar for OTA 22007 Community Partnerships to Advance Science for Society or COMPASS program, community-led health equity structural intervention intervention um, initiative. Next slide. To start, we have some webinar tips. This webinar is being recorded. All participants except NIH staff have been muted. Participants may use the Q&A box to submit their questions. Um, specific scientific inquiries and specific ideas for research projects will not be discussed, but you can please um, send an email to us at cfcompass at od.nih.gov with questions and someone, a program official, will respond to you. Today's webinar will be posted to our website. Um, and if you experience technical difficulties during the webinar, please send an email to Jennifer Aldana and Derek Smith, whose emails are listed on this slide. Next slide. It's my pleasure to have one of our Compass co-chairs, Dr. Shannon Zank, Director of the National Institute of Nursing Research, kick off this webinar with her pre-recorded welcome. Thank you, Yvonne, and good afternoon and welcome to everyone. It's my pleasure to kick off this application webinar for the COMPASS Community-Led Health Equity Structural Interventions Initiative. On behalf of the COMPASS co-chairs, I want to thank you all for your interest in applying to this funding announcement and congratulate you for reaching this step in the application process. Addressing health disparities is a profound challenge that involves many sectors, and it is our hope that structural interventions will catalyze changes that address the underlying causes of health disparities and ultimately advance health equity for all. The COMPASS program has the potential to really get at the structural factors that lead to health disparities in our nation. So we are thrilled to launch the COMPASS program and excited for the research on innovative structural interventions that you all will lead to advance health equity and improve the health of marginalized populations. Yvonne will talk more about the webinar agenda, but again, on behalf of the co-chairs, I thank you again for attending this afternoon. Thank, thank you, Dr. Zank. Um, next slide. Presented on this slide is our updated timeline. Um, we shifted a few of our dates, our key dates that are listed here. As you recall, the invitations to submit a full application were sent out on December 16th. After today's live webinar, we will host two office hours um, on the dates listed there, January 11th and January 24th. And links to the registration for these office hours were included and the invitation to submit a full application email. The deadline for your full application submitted through ASSIST is now Monday, January 30th, 2023. Again, I'll say that the deadline for your applications is now Monday, January 30th, 2023. And note that at the time of submission, the organization as well as the signing official and the principal investigator roles must be registered in ERA Commons. Other individuals listed on the application will also need to have a valid ERA Commons ID. If you have not already done so, please initiate this process now. And details were provided in the invitation to submit a full application email. Applications deemed responsive will be reviewed in April 2023 and negotiations will be held from April through August 2023, with an earliest start date being September 2023. Next slide. So next, we're going to watch a video of our pre-recorded webinar describing the overall COMPASS initiative, the key components of the full application and review, and how to submit your application. Afterwards, my colleague, Dr. Allison Brown, will revisit the updated timeline and moderate our Q&A session. 
Welcome to the Full Application Technical Assistance Pre-Application Webinar for OTA-22-007 Community Partnerships to Advance Science for Society or COMPASS Program, Community-Led Health Equity Structural Intervention Initiative. This pre-application webinar will focus on elements required for submission of a full application. Only community organizations who received an invitation email from NIH to submit a full application will be considered for this funding opportunity. Next slide. I'm Yvonne Ferguson, a program leader at the NIH Common Fund, and we'll begin by acknowledging the 40 NIH staff members representing over 20 institute centers and offices that comprise the Compass Working Group, led by the Compass Working Group co-chairs who have contributed greatly to this effort. Next slide. The co-chairs are Dr. Janine Austin Clayton, Associate Director for Research on Women's Health and Director of the Office of Research on Women's Health. Dr. Joshua Gordon, Director of the National Institute of Mental Health. Dr. Eliseo Perez Estable, Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Dr. David Wilson, Director of the Tribal Health Research Office, and Dr. Shannon Zink, Director of the National Institute of Nursing Research. Next slide. It is also my pleasure to introduce the webinar panelists. They include Jennifer Alvidres, Senior Advisor for Health Disparities in the Office of Disease Prevention, Dr. Allison Brown, one of the Compass Working Group Coordinators and Program Director at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Dr. Shalonda Bynum, another Compass Working Group Coordinator and Program Director of the at the National Institute of Nursing Research. Ms. Christina Folk, Health Science Policy Analyst at the NIH Common Fund and Review Officer for this opportunity. And Dr. Nathan Stinson, Jr., Director of the Division of Community Health and Population Science at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities who also serves as a Compass Working Group Coordinator. Next slide. As for the webinar agenda, after a brief overview of the Compass Program and the NIH Common Fund, we will provide an overview of social determinants of health, structural interventions, and community-led research in the context of the Compass Program. Next, we will provide more specific information about the Compass goals, including its three initiatives with a focus on the Community-Led Health Equity Structural Intervention Initiative and its phases. Next, we will discuss full application requirements and then discuss the data management, budget details, application submission guidance, and the objective review process. We will also discuss other transactions authorities funding instrument, the application submission system, and interface for submission tracking or assist platform and we'll wrap up with the full application timeline and how to submit your questions. Next slide. The Community Partnerships to Advance Science for Society, or COMPASS program, is a new program supported by the NIH Common Fund and has a keen focus on health equity. It is innovative in that it aims to fund community organizations directly to partner with researchers and relevant sectors and design structural interventions that intervene on social determinants of health. The intended impact of COMPASS includes improving health outcomes, reducing health disparities, and advancing health equity research. Next slide. Before we provide you with more details about the opportunity of the full application, I want to provide an overview of the NIH Common Fund. The Common Fund is under the Office of the Director and managed in partnership with the NIH institutes and centers. These programs are designed to address emerging scientific opportunities and pressing challenges in biomedical and behavioral research that no single NIH institute or center can address on its own, but are of high priority for the NIH as a whole. These programs are intended to foster innovative ideas with transformative impact, change paradigms, provide infrastructure to support research, develop innovative tools and technologies, and or provide fundamental foundations for research that can benefit the broad biomedical and behavioral research community. As displayed in the image, the
these programs are developed to be transformative, synergistic, catalytic, cross-cutting, and unique. Next slide. The goal of the NIH Common Fund is to move the NIH mission forward faster. It does this by supporting a series of bold scientific programs designed to catalyze discovery in an area of research relevant to the NIH mission. These areas of research are cross-cutting. Rather than focusing on one disease or organ system, and advance the missions of multiple NIH institutes and centers. Common fund programs are designed so that each deliverable will spur subsequent biomedical and behavioral science advances that otherwise would not be possible without our strategic investment. Next slide. And now that I've covered the background of the NIH Common Fund, I will now turn it over to my colleague, Jennifer Alvidres, who will highlight the scientific basis for COMPASS and the community-led health equity structural interventions. Jennifer? Thank you, Vaughn. Hello, everyone. So despite longstanding investments to reduce and eliminate health disparities, minoritized racial and ethnic groups and other marginalized populations continue to bear a disproportionate burden of adverse health outcomes across diseases and conditions and across the lifespan. Addressing health disparities and advancing health equity is a profound challenge and very complex. It involves many sectors and extends beyond intervening only in traditional healthcare settings. Social determinants of health are a major contributor to health disparities and operate on a continuum from fundamental structural causes to individual and family circumstances. The image on the right shows the Healthy People 2030 framework for social determinants of health which includes the domains of education, access, and quality, economic stability, social and community context, neighborhood and built environment, and healthcare access and quality. Addressing fundamental structural causes of health disparities in these domains offers the greatest opportunity to advance health equity and eliminate health disparities. Next slide, please. So what are structural interventions? Using Brown and colleagues' definition, Structural interventions attempt to alter the social, physical, economic, and or political environments that influence health behaviors and drive and sustain health disparities. Structural interventions move beyond addressing individual characteristics, knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors to target factors such as economic instability, limited educational employment opportunity, societal racism, systemic discrimination, and lack of resources which limit neighborhoods access to healthy food, clean water, physical activity spaces, transportation, and health care. Structural interventions are really needed to advance health equity for the most disadvantaged communities and tackle the root causes of health disparities. This is why structural interventions are the focus of COMPASS. Next slide, please. Structural interventions, because they move beyond intervening just with individuals, address a variety of factors and span multiple sectors. These include human and social services, commerce, clinical care and public health, economic and urban development, transportation, education, housing, the criminal uh, and juvenile justice systems, and others. Multi-sectoral partnerships across these areas that transcend historical silos, maximize the opportunity to address structural factors and advance health equity. Next slide, please. Because this is an NIH initiative, structural interventions need to directly improve health and be connected to health outcomes. So some examples of structural interventions that have the potential to influence health outcomes include, but are not limited to, criminal justice system policy changes to address structural, racial, ethnic, or socioeconomic discrimination, universal basic income programs and policies to address issues of in economic instability, high-speed broadband internet expansion to enhance internet connectivity and access to telehealth and other resources in rural and other underserved communities, and community re revitalization and investment projects to enhance neighborhood and community resources and facilitate health-promoting behaviors. And you can see more examples in the program announcement. Next slide, please. So a key aspect um, to COMPASS is that, center, it, is that it centers around community-led research. 
Given historical disenfranchisement of populations that experience health disparities, community engaged approaches are recognized as key strategies to address health disparities and advance health equity. Community led research changes the process by which research has traditionally been conducted. So if community engaged research means that the community has a seat at the table, community led research means that it's the community's table and they can invite researchers and other collaborators to have a seat at that table. Community led research requires, therefore, a transformation in the processes and practices that govern research engagement. Community led research also aligns with NIH's goal to enhance acceptability and sustainability of effective interventions. So overall, Compass's approach to focus on community led multi sectoral health equity structural interventions will help advance health equity and sustain positive health impacts for all communities. Now I'll pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Shalanda Bynum, to provide the overview of company. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello to you all. In this next segment of the webinar, I will provide an overview of Compass goals, initiatives, and activities. Next slide. So the Common Fund Program goals are intended to be achieved within a 10-year time frame. The overall goals are twofold. First, to catalyze, deploy, and assess community-led structural interventions that leverage multi-sectorial partnerships across multiple sectors with the goal of advancing health equity. The second goal is to develop a new health equity research model for community-led structural intervention research across the NIH and also across the federal government. The intention is that the goals of COMPASS will be achieved in partnership with multiple sectors, including federal agencies, businesses, and local and state governments through the formation of a local and national health equity research assembly. Next slide. So COMPASS is transformative and quite unique in its focus on community-led structural interventions given the limited investment in this research area and the evidence impact of structural inequities on health outcomes. There are three initiatives that comprise the COMPASS program. The Community-Led Health Equity Structural Interventions, also known as CHESIs, which is the initiative of focus today. The Health Equity Research Hubs, which will provide localized technical assistance and scientific support to the CHESIs. And lastly, the Coordination Center, which will lead overall program management and coordination of COMPASS. Next slide. As mentioned earlier, the COMPASS program will be implemented over a 10-year time frame. The plan budget is approximately $153 million over the next five years, which will fund up to 25 community-led structural interventions, up to five health equity research hubs beginning in fiscal year 24, and one coordination center. Overall, this significant investment highlights NIH's commitment to advancing health equity. Next slide. In summary, COMPASS goals will be achieved by the following activities. Supporting community organizations and their research partners in co-creating structural interventions. By engaging multi-sectorial partners, both locally and nationally, in advising, guiding, and sustaining these interventions. By building capacity among community organizations and their research partners in structural intervention research, community-led research, and sustainability efforts. By developing methods for capturing social determinants of health information. And lastly, by disseminating promising approaches resulting from this investment. Next slide. So the focus of today's webinar is on the full application portion of this initiative. In this program, again, community organizations will develop, implement, assess, and disseminate innovative co-created community-led health equity structural interventions in partnership with research organizations and other collaborators. Next slide. 
A three-phase approach will be used to guide the conduct of this research. The first two years, that is phase one of the program, will involve intervention planning. This phase will include developing and piloting, as appropriate, the structural intervention, building research capacity, forging partnerships, and developing a local health equity research assembly to provide localized research facilitation and sustainability support. The local HERA could include regional federal agency representatives from Housing and Urban Development and the Indian Health Service, non-governmental partners, policymakers, and local healthcare organizations. Phase two will focus on implementation of the structural interventions in years three through eight. During this phase, the structural level interventions will be implemented in partnership with the local HERA and must influence health outcomes across multiple diseases and conditions. The final phase of this initiative, phase three, will focus on assessment, dissemination, and sustainability activities, including assessing the health impacts of the intervention and developing dissemination and sustainability plans. So now that I have provided an overview of COMPASS and its various, various initiatives, I will now pass it to my fellow working group coordinator, Dr. Allison Brown, to provide an overview of the full application requ requirements. Allison. Thank you, Shalanda, and welcome again, everyone. Uh, so the next session section of this webinar will focus on the full application requirements for the CHESI initiative. Next slide. So the webinar will, this uh, portion of the webinar will particularly focus on the core sections of the application. So these sections include the abstract, the specific aims, a listing of the senior uh, key personnel and other significant contributors, the application research plan, uh, the data management and sharing plan, the PHS human subjects and clinical trials information, as well as the organizational letter of support and additional letters of support of the bibliography, the copy of the invitation to submit a full application, and the budget details. And notably, we won't go over each section of the full application. For example, the multiple principal investigator leadership plan, nor the plan for enhancing diverse perspectives will be included, but applicants therefore are encouraged to see the funding opportunity for complete sections and details, including the format and page length requirements. Next slide. So your application will need to include an abstract and specific aims uh, with the abstract providing a summary of your application in no more than 250 words. The specific aim should provide a cogent overview of the proposed structural intervention under sections titled significance, innovation, and impact. Some questions for consideration in this section, but that are not limited to include what is the challenge or opportunity that's the focus of your proposed structural intervention? Why is this significant for health disparities or health equity research? And what is the overall approach uh, you and your research team are proposing? What are the innovative aspects of your application? And lastly, what would the impact be on our scientific understanding of health disparities and advancing health equity? Next slide. So the next core section is a senior key personnel and other contributors section, which should include a biosketch of each individual, which should be no more than three pages per person. And the bio sketch should include the person's name and position title, their education and or training, a list of positions and employment in chronological order, as well as their personal statement that briefly describes the individual's role in the project and while, why they're well suited for this specific role. For more details, please go to the research opportunity announcement and the format used for a typical NIH grant application is acceptable but not a requirement for other transactions. Next slide. So the next section, which is arguably the most important section of the application is the application research plan. And this section should be no more than 10 pages and should be organized into the following four sections. These include significance, investigators, organizational capacity, and lastly, the structural intervention research planning process. And I'll go over each of these sections in the following slides. Next slide. So the first section of the research plan is the significant section in which applicants should describe the health problem or problems being addressed 
using relevant data. And this could include local level data, community health assessment data, or other relevant data sources. This section should also discuss the upstream structural factors contributing to the NIH designated population experiencing health disparities and how the proposal will address these specific factors. The next section of the research plan is the investigator section in which key personnel, community partners, and other personnel should be identified and their specific role should also be described. Given the multi-sectoral nature of this initiative, this section will be important to outline the partners that will make your intervention successful. Next slide. So the next section should include a description of your organizational capacity and explain the team's experience working within partnerships to address health and health disparities. It should also demonstrate the organization's commitment to supporting the proposed research. And lastly, the research plan should describe the structural intervention research planning process including the structural factors that are the focus for the proposed intervention and how they will be measured. It should also include how these structural factors influence the NIH designated populations that experience health disparities. The section should also describe the proposed primary and secondary health outcomes of interest and plans for how these will be measured. So with that said, I will now let my colleague and fellow work group coordinator, Dr. Nathan Stinson, review the additional requirements for the full application. Thank you, Allison, and welcome to everyone. The next section of the full application is the data management and sharing plan, which should be no more than two pages. In accordance with NIH policy for data management and sharing, all applications should describe how the proposed data generated from the project will be managed and shared. For elements to include in the data management and share plan, please see writing a data management and sharing plan slash data sharing at NIH.gov and notice NOT OD 21 014 supplemental information to the NIH policy for data management and sharing, elements of an NIH data management and sharing plan. Next slide, please. The next section is the PHS human subjects and clinical trials information for data dash delayed onset study. All proposals submitted for this research opportunity involve human subjects research and are designated as clinical trials. Therefore, all applicants must answer yes to the question, are human subjects involved on the other project information uh, form? The proposals are also required to be designated as delayed onset study. For delayed onset studies, it generally means that human subjects research is anticipated within the period of the award, but definite plans for this involvement cannot be described in the application. In this section, ap applicants are also responsible for identifying a local institutional review board, also known as an IRB, for the project sites. For this, applicants are encouraged to leverage their research partner uh, IRB or utilize the services of an independent IRB. However, the Compass Coordination Center will also support award recipients in preparing their IRB protocol for submission. Next slide, please. There is also additional information in the full application, including organizational letters of support from the applicant's organizations, which includes the institutional commitment for the project and to enter negotiated OT or other transaction agreements. This section should also include letters of support from research partners, collaborators, consultants, and partnering community organizations. And lastly, a bibliography should be included as well as a copy of the NIH email invitation to submit a full application. Next slide, please. The last two slides will cover the budget details required for the full application. All applicants must provide a fully justified annual budget and cost proposal for the three phases of the initiative. 
annual budgets are expected not to exceed $750,000 total costs for years one and two, $1.5 million total costs for years three through eight, and no more than $750,000 total costs for years nine and 10. Applicants must complete the SF 424 budget form and the and the fine budget form and instructions can be found uh, in the research opportunity announcement. Please note that you do not need to complete the budget form in the application submission system, also known as ASSIST. Next slide. The, the budget details section must provide the overall expected cost for each of the categories listed here. These include personnel, travel, subawards or subcontract or consultant costs, including research partners and community partners, institutional review board associated costs, other direct costs, and the total cost with the indirect costs included. Overall, applicants must provide a justification for all budget items and sub awards and also need to provide details of cost breakdown. For more information on the budget instructions and forms, please go to the website https colon forward slash forward slash commonfund.nih.gov slash OT forms. Next slide. To end this section, we want to share how to submit your full application. Unlike your emailed letter of intent, you will need to prepare and submit your application using the NIH's assist system no later than January 23rd, 2023 at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time. As a reminder, these applications are invitation only, and the NIH will not review those that were not invited to submit a full application. Additionally, the complete applications must be submitted by your organization's recipient business official or signing official. Also, a key thing to note is that your organization must be registered in ERA Commons with one person designated as the primary uh, investigator, the PI, and the other person designated as the signing official, also known as the SO. With that, I will now turn it over to Christina Falk of the NIH Common Fund, who will go over the full application review process. Thank you, Nathan. Now that my colleagues have reviewed the core requirements for the full application, I will review the full application review information and process. Since this initiative is using the other transactions authority, there are a few key things to note about the review process. Particularly, applicants are not, applications are not reviewed by the standard NIH peer review process. Instead, applications undergo a custom review process referred to as objective review, which involves the submission of written critiques by subject matter experts against the review criteria and interactive discussions between those experts and NIH program staff. Next slide, please. The review will be based on four review criteria. This includes the significance, which is worth up to 15 points. Key questions that the reviewers will ask include, does the applicant's proposed project address an important problem or structural barrier to health? Is there inclusion of local community level data describing the problem or structural barrier to health? How does the applicant describe the proposed project's impact on health outcomes? The next criteria is the community investigators, which is a total of 30 points. Questions that the reviewers will ask in scoring this criteria include, does the applicant and their research partners have the requisite expertise and experience to ensure the successful conduct of a structural intervention? How well does the experience and of the research partner 
align with the scientific requirements of the proposed research? Does the research team demonstrate appropriate experience in addressing health disparities or advancing health equity? The next criteria is organizational capacity, which is a total of 25 points. Key questions for consideration for this item include, but are not limited to, to what extent has the applicant adequately described their collaboration experience? Does the applicant adequately describe their expertise in building and working in community partnerships? And lastly, there is the structural interventions planning criteria, which is worth up to 30 points and based on the following questions. How well does the applicant describe the structural factors of interest and its impact on health outcomes? Does the applicant include an appropriate intervention planning approach? Is the potential participant reach compelling? When preparing your application, it will be key for you to ensure that your proposal addresses these key questions. For more details, please see the research opportunity announcement. Next slide, please. In this last slide, I will, I will cover how funding decisions will be made. Funding decisions will be based on the outcome of the objective review described in the previous slide. Agreements for all awards will be negotiated with applicants determined to provide the best value to the NIH in achieving the COMPASS goals. Funding decisions will also consider achieving a balance of awards based on representation of the diversity of NIH designated health disparities populations that experience health disparities in the United States, graphic diversity across the US, diversity of the proposed structural intervention ideas, topics, and potential for public health impact. Important to note is that appeals of funding decisions will not be accepted for this initiative. I'll now turn it back to Yvonne to provide an overview, overview of the funding mechanism used for this initiative and the application system you will use to submit your application. Thank you, Christina. I will talk briefly about the Other Transactions Authority funding instrument and provide an overview of the application submission system and interface for submission tracking or the ASSIST platform. Next slide. As previously mentioned, this funding opportunity utilizes the Other Transactions Authority awarding instrument. Other transactions are different than other traditional NIH funding mechanisms, such as grants, cooperative agreements, or contracts. Other transactions allow for the nimble addition or subtraction of expertise, tools, technologies, and partnerships to meet program needs. With other transactions, NIH may propose or require changes outside of the scope of the opportunity and or the application to meet program needs. Other transactions facilitate engagement of non-traditional partners, have reporting requirements that are tailored for each award, and funding can be based on a number of factors to, to meet programmatic needs, such as the achievement of agreed upon activities, the availability of funds, or it could be terminated or extended by NIH to align with programmatic needs. Next slide. For those familiar with other funding mechanisms from NIH, such as grants, cooperative agreements, and contracts, this slide highlights the differences between these mechanisms and other transactions. Other transactions are legally binding instruments that may be used for a broad range of research and activities based on an other transactions authority. Unlike other mechanisms, other transactions allow for a greater collaboration between NIH and the principal investigators. As mentioned in the previous slide, it is nimbler and allows for the award to be responsive to changing priorities. For other transactions, federal laws and NIH policies are applicable as well as congressional authorizing language. Similar to the other mechanisms, other transactions are governed by overarching federal laws, regulations, and policies. And lastly, applications submitted to other transactions undergo a scientific evaluation or an objective review process, which is different from the application review process for grants, cooperative agreements, or contracts. Next slide. 
Next slide. This slide reiterates key aspects of other transactions authorities. It's a funding opportunity that allows NIH to reach non-traditional partners, specifically community organizations. It allows for a more custom review process where NIH can recruit people with lived experience and people who currently work for and with community organizations to be part of the review process for the full application submitted to this opportunity. Finally, it provides flexibility for NIH on how awards are managed. Next slide. The application submission system and interface for submission tracking or assist platform must be used for submitting all full applications. Next slide. As a starting point, please visit the following website, https colon forward slash forward slash ERA dot NIH dot GOV forward slash help dash tutorials forward slash assist forward slash ERA dash training dash assist dot HTM for specific instructions on how to submit your application using the assist platform. Next slide. Assist is a web based platform used to prepare and submit applications electronically to NIH and other public health service agencies. Next slide. To prepare to submit your full application, we are sharing the following guidance. As previously mentioned at the time of submission, the principal investigator and their organization must be registered in our ERA Commons platform. Please note that this can take up to six weeks or more to complete. Separate from the principal investigator role, there must also be someone designated as the recipient's business official or signing official. If an application is awarded, additional registrations are required. Once organizations are registered with ERA Commons, they can access NIH's assist platform to assist their full application submission. To complete the full application, users must have access to a browser, a PDF generator, or Adobe Reader software. Next slide. Additionally, for full applications, please see the specific instructions in the funding opportunity. And for questions, please contact the scientific context listed in the funding opportunity. And if you have questions about submitting your full application via the assist platform, please contact the ERA Commons help desk at 866-504-9552 and reference OTA-22-007 and your submission for assistance. So with that, I will turn it over to Allison to review the timeline and provide guidance on how to submit your questions. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, so before we close, we really want to reiterate the timeline and key upcoming due dates. So as mentioned, full applications are invite only and invitations will be sent by December 8th. We will have a live webinar for those invited applicants on December 13th, and those individuals will receive registration details via email. We also plan to host office hours for those invited to submit a full application and these will be held in December and January before the full application submission deadline of January 23rd, 2023. So please stay tuned for these additional details. Once applications are submitted, the full applications will be peer reviewed in March 2023 and nego negotiations will be held from April through August of 2023. And thereafter, the applications will be reviewed by Council in August of 2023 with the earliest start date of September. Next slide. So with that, we wanna encourage you to submit your questions to cfcompass at od.nih.gov. We also encourage you to look at the frequently asked questions guide that provide, that's provided on the Compass website for additional guidance. And with that, thank you for attending this webinar and we wish you the best in submitting your full application if invited to submit.
Thank you all and uh, welcome back. Um, hopefully you enjoyed the pre-recorded webinar. Uh, we have had a lot of questions come in asking for clarification around the due date. Um, so note that the due date has been updated to January 30th, 2023. Um, so you would need to submit your full application via assist by this deadline. Noting that the 5 p.m. time frame is based on the local time of your applicant organization. Um, so please note this shift um, in the timeline. And as previously mentioned by Yvonne, the ERA Commons and registration in ERA Commons may take up to six weeks or more to complete. So hopefully by now uh, you've already initiated this process as encouraged in your letter of intent, uh, invitation that was sent out in December. Again, note that the deadline of 5 p.m. is based on your local time of the applicant organization. Uh, we also had a question come in about the office hours. Uh, so note that these are optional that, and that they will be held on January 11th and January 24th. Um, and these office hours are really just optional to allow you as applicants to, to ask any additional questions in your full application preparation process. Um, so with that, uh, the, the, what's noted on this slide are the actual actual times of the uh, office hours. Uh, we encourage you to uh, register for these office hours, and this was included in your invitation email. And if you haven't already, please sign up for the Compass Listserv um, as listed here. So CF Compass underscore Listserv at list.nih.gov. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so with that, uh, we will now transition to the question and answer portion of today's webinar. We have quite a few questions that have come in, um, so thank you for your engagement. Several of them hopefully have been answered during the pre-recorded webinar, and many of the questions uh, were asking for clarification on the timeline for submission. So again, the update for the sub submission is January 30th. Um, but before we dive into a lot of the questions, um, we've had several that revolved around the budget um, and clarification around the budget, given that the ROA uh, instructs you as the applicants to prepare a 10-year budget, but that the award period of performance is for five years. Uh, so with that, I'll pass it over to Dr. Ferguson to address this common question that we've received. Um, thanks, Allison, for that. I want to make sure I have my notes up correctly. So um, we do ask um, again in the application budget for all three phases of the program and the phases of the program span 10 years. Um, we do understand that the start date and end dates span five years and we put that into the invitation, the letter of invitation of the start date and the end date. NIH approves the budget for other transaction authorities for five and five-year increments. However, the COMPASS program was designed um, to be ten, a 10-year ten program, and therefore full applications must include budget details for the entire 10 years. Um, we provided in the letter of invitation and also in our frequently asked questions, and I know um, in the Q&A or in the chat, there will or should be links to our frequently asked questions. And we provide categories to include in the budget. And that is also detailed in the funding announcement. Um, and so definitely look at that um, table and the funding announcement for specific details and categories. Um, and we present the budget um, summary in that way. Um, there are also questions about the costs, and again, that is also in our the budget summary table and also in the funding announcement FAQs that we have um, listed on our website that, um, for example, the total costs um, for year one are 750 thousand total cost, year two is 750 thousand total cost, year three, is 1.5 million total cost, and that is year three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Our each year is 1.5 million total cost. Year nine is 750,000 total cost, and year 10 is 750,000 total cost. So again, um, 
to provide more detail. And I know um, folks have been asking in the Q&A and also in our emails to us about the specific amounts. Great, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, nope, that, that's it. OK, oh, I have one more. Sorry. Um, there's another question about um, indirect and F&A uh, cost. And for other transactions, there is no F&A or indirect cost required. Thus, the total costs allowed are those listed in the funding announcement and also stated in the FAQs. Great. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, we also received questions ahead of time, and then I think a, a couple of them looked at uh, addressing policy change, and we're aware that upstream structural interventions often require policy change. So can you clarify on the policy work that's allowed with this funding, um, given that structural interventions relate often to policy change? Can you clarify that? Sure. So um, the policy change um, that we listed in the invitation letter, um, in terms of lobbying and advocacy is not um, allowed and the other transactions mechanism funding announcement that we're using is not um, aligned with that. So we wanted for the applications to have um, clarity and have link to the policy on that. Um, in terms of um, policy, we were uh, looking at the bigger scope of how different policies that are upcoming and ongoing and seeing if those structural interventions that are proposed um, are aligned with upcoming and ongoing um, federal, local, state policies that are in process. Um, and so that is another um, question that has been asked about that. We just wanted to provide some clarity. We'll also provide some clarity in our frequently asked questions that we encourage all applicants to definitely um, um, go to frequently because they will be updated based on um, today's webinar. Great. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, another question is about how we define key personnel and who will be required to submit a biosketch. So I think um, that was one of the questions answered in the Q&A. And so those that have a um, specific role um, should include a bio sketch. Uh, a specific role or responsibility should include a, a bio sketch in, um, in terms of key personnel. So even if they are a consultant, um, if they're a co-investigator, definitely the principal investigator, the research partner, should all um, provide a bio sketch. Um, you will see in the application funding announcement that it is not as um, in depth or detail as a traditional NIH bio sketch. Um, so please look at the funding opportunity, um, look at the research opportunity announcement um, for details in terms of the bio sketch and the and the limits, the page limits of those the bio sketch for this. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, there was another question about the proposed structural intervention with the understanding that the first two years are, are really aimed at helping to determine the structural intervention. So the um, the applicant was asking for clarity on um, kind of how to reconcile those. So as you'll note in the ROA, you know, the research planning or the application research plan really should outline the, the structural intervention research planning process. Um, and you'll you'll be requested to really discuss and describe the structural factors that are the focus of your intervention. Um, and it really should emphasize the planning process. The key part of COMPASS is really the community engagement and uh, the co-creation of the research um, in partnership with the research partners, but then also the community partners as well. So the bulk of that section really should really be talking about the, the planning process that goes into the structural intervention. So we understand that you may not have all of the details outlined, but you should um, really discuss the proposed health outcomes that could be impacted, um, the potential participants and the reach of the structural intervention, the geographic area, obviously the community partners that you'll be partnering with and really describing that approach for co-creation of the intervention and the planning and the development of the intervention itself. 
Um, so we understand that at this stage, you may not have all of the details outlined for the structural intervention, but in that research plan and that section of the full application, you should really uh, highlight um, your community partners, but really in your organizational capacity, but then also the research planning process and what that structural intervention um, or that what that plan will look like for development of the structural intervention. Um, so then another question that came in is, um, is it acceptable for the applicant to use our, the internal IRB for their research application um, and have their research staff handle most aspects of the evaluation and collaboration with their research partner? So this question really is about, can they use their internal IRB for the research application? So I'll pass that to Yvonne. Yeah, I can answer that. So um, for the IRB, um, I, I do want to reiterate that the IRB costs are part of the budget. So definitely include that. Um, we um, suggest that you leverage or work with your research partners um, for their institution um, IRB and, those, and get um, clarity on those associated costs. So using um, the resources at a, um, an institution of your research partner will be helpful. There's also independent IRBs that um, are accessible that should be investigated in terms of their cost and fees to go into your budget. Okay, great, thank you. There was also comment around issues of downloading the budget forms. Um, so there was something noted that if you open the budget form in Adobe, instead of trying to open it in your browser, then you might have more success there. Um, but a link has been provided in the, the Q&A box on where to find those budget forms. And if you're still having issues, if you try to open it up in Adobe instead of the office um, or your browser, then please follow up via email. But hopefully that issue is resolved once you open it in Adobe. Um, another question is whether or not there, um, there's a required percent for the project PI or co-PI um, on the application. And uh, if not, can, they, can the selected PI be reflected as in-kind or in uh, the budget? So is there a requirement for percent effort for the PI or co-PI? So there isn't a specific percent effort, but again, you want um, the PI and, and everyone involved to have their percent effort that is aligned with the project that you're proposing. So there isn't a specific requirement for the percent um, effort stated in the research opportunity announcement. But again, you want um, the expertise of the principal investigator, the research partners, um, and also the community partners and all those involved to be um, aligned with the project that you're proposing. Great, thank you. We also have quite a few questions about if all personnel listed in a grant need to be registered in ERA Commons. Can you answer that, Yvonne? Yeah, so um, who is specifically required and must be um, registered prior to submitting your application is your organization, your signing official, and principal investigator. Um, the other collaborators and investigators should be, and we encourage that they, if they don't already have an ERA Commons ID, to get one, and that can be done um, by the, once the organization gets um, an ERA Commons account, they can make accounts for those collaborators um, and other uh, uh, individuals that are on their application. So I guess the first step again is to get your ERA Commons ID for the organization, for the signing official, the principal investigator, um, there was a question in the chat if the signing official and the principal investigator can be the same person. Um, they can, and that was answered in the chat. And there's also um, an app, a link to the instructions for assist in ERA Commons. 
Um, and that's also linked in our FAQs. And if it's not already linked in the group chat, we'll try to put in the chat before um, the webinar is over. And it's a detailed instruction document for assist on how to go about um, registering and also how to go about um, inputting the information needed for your application, uploading um, sections of the document and assist in, in other important details. And so we'll put that also in the chat. Okay, awesome, thank you. So we have a, another question from an academic research partner um, and they're wondering if they could serve as a co-investigator on multiple applications if the structural interventions are unique. So that's somewhat of an eligibility question. That me too? Yes. <laughs> um, so, I, and this also goes into the, the a conflict question as well that I think that we've answered in our FAQs. Um, can a research investigator be on multiple uh, community-led um, health equity structural interventions? Yes, they can be on multiple. Um, however, um, there is, for those that are also applying for the Coordination Center, um, those researchers uh, would have to, could not be, the researcher specifically could not be on both the awarded um, Coordination Center and also a community-led health equity structural intervention. However, the institution is able to um, be on both. So, for example, if an institution, if a researcher, um, research partner belongs to an institution um, that is applying for a CHESI, they can also, the institution can also apply for the coordination center. So the conflict is not there. However, if the research partner um, is a key personnel on an awarded CHESI and on and and on um, awarded uh, the coordination center, that cannot be the case. That would itself be a conflict, and so the research partner, the researcher, would have to choose whether they would be um, on the awarded CHESI or on the awarded um, uh, coordination center um, award. Great, thank you. Uh, we had another question about the structural interventions and whether or not they would have to lead to measurable health outcomes during the course of the GIG grant. Um, so I'll take that question as noted in the pre-recorded webinar and in the in the ROA, you know, the CHESIS is a three-phase process and during the third phase, um, projects and awardees will assess the health outcomes um, that are impacted by structural intervention. So that could be individual level health outcomes, or it could also be um, health um, health care service utilization, like hospitalizations, ex et cetera. But as you'd imagine, NIH is very much interested in health outcomes. And by nature, structural interventions are intended to impact a variety of health outcomes. So that could be hypertension, diabetes, obesity, of course, not limited to those, um, but a host of other health outcomes that we're interested in. So as a part of your full application, you are to note what health outcomes you intend to be impacted by the proposed structural intervention. Um, another question is uh, related to the Harris. Um, so can the local Harris also include community members and also related to letters of support? Are letters of support required to be included from all persons who will be involved in the local Harris or could they be added later? Uh, so I'll pass this to my colleague, Dr. Boyce, um, related to the local Harris question. So for local Harris, yes, um, local community members are, important and members that can be part of the HERA in terms of letters of support. Um, although not required, they do contribute to strengthening the application because it does show the commitment of those local members and their roles and their commitment to contributing to the HERA that will be part of your application. Okay, great, thank you. Another question related to an applicant organization that will be fiscally sponsored. Um, can they submit their full application or does the fiscal sponsor need to submit the full application? So I'll direct that question to Yvonne.
again, does the if an applicant is being fiscally sponsored, does the community organization fit, uh, submit the full application or does their fiscal sponsor need to submit the application? Esther and Yu Ling as well could chime in if they have that response. Right. So I'm I'm also gonna lean on um you paying for <laughs> guidance on this, but the community organization signing official, whoever is the signing official, needs to submit the application. Um, the fiscal sponsor and that information is needed. Um, it can be provided, must it should be provided if that in fact is the case in the application. Um, but for submitting the application, the, whoever is the signing official for the community organization um, should be submitting the application. Okay, great. Um, you playing or, or others, do you have anything to add to that? And no worries if not. Okay, so another question that came in is similar to another question is about whether or not the full application should cover phase one only or all phases of the research. And again, we direct uh, you to look explicitly at the OTA and the ROA, and you'll note that the application research plan, um, you know, has kind of these key sections, one of which is the structural intervention research planning process, which is mainly phase one. But you also note that we do ask applicants to describe any plans for sustainability of research capacity and the structural intervention efforts. So while this section will mostly uh, focus on phase one, we do hope that applicants will also include uh, plans for sustainability of the research as well. So another question related to NIH's policy for data management and sharing. Um, so as many of you all know, we will have a new policy that will be effective January 25th. Uh, so a question is, is this version, um, should we use this version to use in the grant submission? Um, so I'll direct that to Nathan. Again, the NIH policy for data management sharing will be effective January 25th. And the question is, should this um, new policy be applied for the grant submission for January yes. 30th? Yeah, so, the answer to that question is uh, yes, it is applicable to uh, this uh, submission. And if you look at the uh, um, uh, the ROA, there's some links uh, to uh, additional resources and information uh, around the, what uh, you would need to put in your application around the new uh, uh, data sharing policy. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so another question is about if um, maps and graphs and figures, can they be included in the research plan section? And if so, will this count towards your page limit? And the answer is yes. So you can include any frameworks that you're using to guide the research planning process and kind of your research process overall. You can certainly include figures um, and those will count towards the page limit. So I am kind of working through all of the questions that have come in and uh, given the, the, the depth of questions, we may not be able to get to all of them, uh, but we're certainly working through, through them. Um, so one question is, it seems as though the budget details must include a description for all three phases, um, but again, should it only describe phase one? Is that correct? Yes, mainly the research plan should uh, outline phase one, but that section should also include aspects of sustainability. Um, so there's another question, well, two questions. What's the allowable percentage for FNA for the community organizations in the budget? And what is the allowable percentage FNA for the academic institution, uh, which is potentially a research partner for the community organization? So I'll pass uh, I'll that to, go ahead. I'll just um, reiterate again that FNA and indirect costs are not required for other transactions. So the total costs that are listed in the funding, um, the research um, opportunity announcement are the total cost, which would include um, direct cost and indirect costs if, if those were a part of it. But um, those total costs that are um, listed in our FAQs and also in the announcement are the total costs, which will in should include the indirect. Okay, thank you. And we have received a lot of questions about indirect costs, so hopefully that um, Yvonne's response addresses those inquiries. 
Um, so we have another question. Can we change the PI listed in the LOI with a person employed by the applicant community organization? And can we add a co-PI in the full application that meets the PI requirements? Yes. Okay. Um, another question is about a page limit for the budget justification and whether or not there's a page limit for that. So is there a response to that? Is there a page limit on the budget justification? In the research opportunity announcement, there is no page limit for the budget. Okay. Great. Um, for the question uh, related to application, our applicant organizations who submitted two LOIs and if both were invited for full application submission, is there any guidance on you know, the pros and cons of submitting two full applications from one organization. I, I can answer that if you'd like. Thank you. Um, there is no prohibition. However, um, you do need to think about your the what's best for your organization and for the integrity and the strength of your application. And so in terms of what you submit and what we would award, we'd have to take those things into consideration. So as you proceed, you need to think about the strength of your application, your question, and the work that you would be doing in submitting two applications at the same time within the time that you have and that we proposed for you. Great, thank you, Dr. Boyce. Uh, we've also received several questions about whether they should include travel to the annual compass meeting in the budget um, and does the budget need to include again uh, any travel to any NIH related conferences so I don't believe we've addressed that. Your budget should include those things that are necessary for the requirements that are in the in terms of that you should think about the travel that's required for what you tend to do in the grant which would mean travel required for the tasks that you intend to do, um, any meetings that you would want to present at in terms of scientifically, in terms of community dissemination, and any required meetings that are required for government, for communities, or anything else of that nature. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Um, and then another kind of follow-up question is kind of an idea of how many personnel for the research study are expected to attend that type of conference or the annual COMPASS meeting. Typically, um, meetings require um, key personnel, um, usually around two. Um, in terms of key personnel, getting back to that, key personnel are specified in some of the resources. They are the people that um, would need to be, um, if they were are not the type that could be replaced without permission of a, of a program official, they are essential to the grant. And those are, they have guidelines that we've set out forth in the OT. So do think carefully about who are key personnel as you go forth with your application. Okay, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions related to if an application does not have multiple PIs, they exclude the leadership plan section from your application, and that is correct. So the leadership plan section is only necessary if you plan to have multiple uh, PIs on your application. Okay, so there was another question related to the budget categories and how there's a slight variation from the categories that are listed in the ROA compared to what's in the SF-424 template. And the question is, do we need to stick to the categories from the ROA or go by the SF-424 template? You should stick to the categories that are in the ROA and stick to the categories that are listed in the FAQ document and stick to the categories that are listed um, in the um, invitation to submit a full application. Okay. They should all be the same categories. Great. Right. Another question is um, from an applicant who's planning to address housing as a structural change, and they are wondering if rent could be included in the budget. Say that one more time. 
Sorry. So they were in, sorry, the, the questions keep rolling in. So I'm losing track <laughs> of, on what the question was. I, but I did hear the question. So it's, could rent be included as a cost? So right. um, in terms of payments that go towards housing, that may include rent or could include partial payments in terms of section eight or subsidies or such that could be an allowable cost. So um, rent is a very, is a, is a could mean several things. Um, so and depending on the type of structural intervention, um, I think it would have to be very specific. And as you operationalize that in your grant, it would be very important for it to be an allowable cost. But if it is part of the structural intervention costs that are related to housing that may include housing such as that could be an allowable cost. Okay. But it's important for all of these types of costs to be clearly documented and operationalized. Um, it is important because of, we are going to be very fiscally responsible as a federal government agency to show um, and assign um, how these interventions are working and being able to document it is an important part of our responsibility. Thank you, Dr. Boyce. There are a couple follow-up questions on clarification for which key personnel needs to have an ERA Commons account. So can you reiterate that, Yvonne? Yes. On who needs to have an ERA Commons account? So the organization first should be registered in ERA Commons. The signing official and also the principal investigator or investigators if it's a multi-PI application, must be registered or have an ERA Commons account. Those that are community um, or our partners, collaborators, consultants, the organization can create Commons accounts for those additional key personnel. Great, thank you. We've also had several questions come up related to the annual budget costs. And again, we want to reiterate for applicants to, to go to the FAQs, uh, which outline the annual budget costs uh, per year. So for years one and year two, the total cost uh, may not exceed $750,000. Years three through years eight, uh, annual costs uh, and total costs may not exceed $1.5 million. And then years nine and 10, uh, annual costs should not exceed $750,000 in total costs. So hopefully that is clear. Um, and once again, please refer back to all of the FAQs. And as Yvonne mentioned, uh, these will be, we will be adding to the FAQs based on the great questions that you guys have shared today. Um, so please go back and look at those uh, throughout the course of the preparation for your full application. Again, I'm looking through several of the questions have been answered related to kind of the ERA Commons account, um, you know, and which key personnel need to have a ERA Commons account. So several of those questions are, have answered. Um, so another, this kind of goes back to the advocacy question. Um, can advocating for administrative improvements by government agencies be funded within the monies uh, requested in this um, in this Chessie application. So you wanna reiterate that point again, Yvonne? Sure. So um, as specified in the um, invitation to submit a full application about the aspects of uh, lobbying and how that is not allowed um, with federal dollars. And so, and align with that, I, I suggest that everyone um, read that policy and specific policy change advocacy um, activities um, would not be part of uh, the purview of the structural intervention. However, if it's a current or upcoming um, policy that is um, that is 
to come into place. And the structural intervention is built around that upcoming or, or, or current or upcoming policy change, then that kind of structural intervention activity would be allowed. Um, but again, there would, I think NIH on our part would, would need to see more context to what is specifically um, proposed. So um, provide clarity and specifics on that type of activity or any activities that um, will be proposed should be um, detailed in your application. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, are research partners, um, do they have to be tied to academic institutions? And that question is no, you don't necessarily, your research partners do not have to be um, at academic institutions. They could be at nonprofits that do work around research. Um, they could be at other kind of research oriented organizations. Um, but again, the, your research partner does not necessarily need to be tied to an academic institution. Uh, there is a question, is there a limit on how many research partners can be included in your application? And the answer is no, there is no limit. Um, but again, note that this is uh, the goal of the CHESI award is that it's community led and community driven in partnership and co-creation with your research partners. So we really do want to ensure that the community organizations are leading and driving in the work uh, based on what we heard in our listening sessions last fall. So great question. So I did see another question in the chat, Allison. Please. about um, letters you. of support mm -hmm. and um, if there was a limit to those letters of support and that um, the answer is no there's no limit to the letters of support however um, the letters of support should outline the roles and responsibilities of the the um, the roles and responsibilities of those individuals or that organization will have in your proposed project. Um, and so they should be aligned and, and specific on their role or responsibility in your proposed uh, project. Great, thank you, Yvonne. Um, so it has been brought to my attention that the budget form links may not be working. So thank you for those who have reiterated that in the Q&A. So we will double check that. Um, and if there is any error, we will fix it on our end. Um, so thank you for raising that again. There's a question about how detailed the budget is expected to be for phase two and three, given that it is a deferred onset and um, the planning phase will really have implications for phase two and three. So we have someone that will answer that question. Again, how detailed is the budget expected to be for the latter phases, given that those phases um, are based right. on the planning phase? Right. Um, so they should be as detailed as they can be, noting that the total costs listed are the total costs. So those total costs are not going to be changed. Um, so just note that the total costs are the total costs and um, the um, the reviewers will be oriented in terms of knowing that um, your details in terms of phase two and phase three are not going to be as detailed because those are far further out. Um, there was another question about the um, transition or the, the transition from phase uh, one to phase two and how many will quote unquote make it. Um, of the um, up to 25 awards, uh, NIH would like everyone to make it to phase uh, two. However, um, in terms of phase one, um, there is a section in the research opportunity announcement that specifies um, what NIH will be assessing in terms of uh, the an administrative review um, of those that go from phase one um, to phase two. So please definitely look at that for more details. Great. Thank you, Yvonne. 
We have another question about the organizational capacity section of the research plan and whether or not applicants are um, meant to describe the capacity of the team or focus only on the organization. So again, we highly recommend you look closely at the ROA. So you're to describe your team's experience working within partnerships to address health disparities, but then also discuss your organizational commitment as well as your organization's uh, fiscal management processes and experience. So it's not only your organizational capacity, but also your team's um, capacity as well. So it should be, um, you should focus on both aspects of that. Um, we are mindful of time, it's 2.28. So I think there might be one last question um, to address. Um, so and that's whether the research plan should be for 10 years or based on the 10 year budget. So again, look closer at the ROA and look explicitly at that section for the full application. That's really to focus on the application uh, research plan. And you'll note that a bulk of that section should focus on the structural interventions and research planning process. Um, and then to a certain extent, uh, discussion around the plans for sustainability of the interventions and the research capacity post NIH funding. Um, so with that, I will turn us uh, turn it back over to Dr. Ferguson. Uh, we note we've had quite a few questions come in. Uh, we thank you all for joining and hope you can attend the office hours as well to get any additional follow up questions answered, but to look really closely at those FAQs. All right, Yvonne. Um, next slide, please. We do want to thank everyone again for joining us. Please um, look out for the FAQs. Um, they will be updated frequently. You'll see we had a lot of questions we were not, not able to answer today. Um, just a few reminders. Um, please submit your full application through ASSIST. Um, that platform and the due date deadline is January 30th, 2023. Um, 5 p.m. by your local time. Um, as a reminder, the full application must be submitted by the community organization's uh, um, signing official. And please email us at cfcompass at od.nih.gov. And again, we want to thank you again for um, joining us this afternoon. Um, register, please, for the office hours offered. And we wish you luck in submitting your preparing and submitting your full application.